This is really just like the very quick starting point, settle the scene for the next three and a half hours, including our nice little break in between. Uh, slide set is by Kay to me. And just to get you an understanding, we have already safety in criti safety critic system around there which use Linux. Uh, well, Tesla is one example. We don't see too much from them in the open on their work, but actually that's running in there. And that's just an example car. So there are many other cars which also make use of Linux, like in Asia. And of course, also in space, right? So that's super cool. It's another kind of safety criticality also, but I mean, it's human life rockets, and you know that you have a risk when you go there into space, but well, maybe it's you're expecting another kind of risk when you take a car. That's just two examples. Other industries are medical, uh, industrial applications, and so on. So it's just like heading this up. And a little bit on the definition of it, so we know, okay, that's, that's the scene in which we are. As per the definition, I guess it was the one from, you call you took it from Wikipedia, or somewhere around, or somewhere. Oh, yeah, no but it's like, Definition of safety is the freedom from unacceptable risk of physical injury or of damage of the health of people, either directly or indirectly, because of damage of the property of the environment. A little bit lengthy, but what you see is like, don't, you want to prevent hurt from people, potentially animals, you could also treat this as a safety element in there. And the functional safety is like the part of the safety that depends on a system or equipment operating correctly in the response to its inputs. So it means like how does a system behave in the environment. And you would like to see that you detect any dangerous conditions, you want to make sure that it operates as it is expected, uh, that you prevent potential hazards by the mechanisms which you implement. So it's like looking on a more rigorous part and as this confusion sometimes pops up, I hope, as you decided to come here, you're aware that there is the difference between the safety and the security part, while well, there's strong overlaps and a bunch of former security people became safety people. That's on that. And what you typically expect, and I guess it goes to the focus on what we have here, that a system or software <coughs> behaves as specified and it also must not impair or interfere with other system components. This may be also a strong difference to what you know from the security side, because in security you would say, oh, I have my container, I'm good in my container, I know my environment. And for safety, probably you would say, well, could the one container impact another container? And if you take it more on the hardware side, you could imagine like if there's a heavy GPU load thing, while your safety application runs on the CPU, the GPU heats up, you go into dynamic voltage frequency scaling and so on, and suddenly you impact your scheduling mechanisms because there's not, not so much load which you can handle. So it's like interference which you can keep in mind. And then you also need to show later on to authorities, and you also want it for yourself that you have evidence on whatever you've done and that you really covered the errors cases uh, somehow or somewhere, so it doesn't need to be directly in Linux, it could also be in the system environment around it with hardware measures or whatever. Right, and this is just a list of sample standards. Uh, it has integrity standards, which you can see. The interesting difference between a safety standard and an integrity standard, which makes it more complicated, a safety standard would tell you, oh, I'm doing you have like for the safety standards for toys which tell you how long you need to put them under fire until they are allowed to start burning, something like this. They give you clear instructions what you do. The integrity standards basically just profile, define procedures and say then, yeah, these are best practices from process side, from other parts, and here's the requirements, here's evidence on this. So it's basically like looking into this and uh, you need to test a lot, so, but it just describes methodology and not like what is your threshold or part of it at the end. Right, and all these different standards which you have seen from all the different kind of industry, it often boils down that you need to have kind of a requirement, like <coughs> the, what do you expect from this? Uh, yeah, it's uh, being explicit about the assertion, and then you have testing a lot, you have evidence on what you have done, on your verification, you have to document a whole lot of things. So uh, someone said it's like 20% is like a normal work and when it comes to safety, you add like 80% of testing and documentation <coughs> of the same things and you try to get this traceable. 
Right, and there are ways for traceability, which is a perfect handover to Kate. <laughs> yeah, so one of the biggest realizations for me when I started working in this area was you only look at safety in terms of a system. And something like the Linux kernel is a component in a system. But it'll be used in a context of that system. And the interesting thing is that if you're having a system that has some safe usage requirements, it's going to have various needs. And those needs are going to be matched up by effectively assertions about that component or requirements or things that that requ the expectations of what you expect that requirement to do, that component to do. And traditional, all those traditional standards that um, Philip was just showing you, they are lined up with this mental model in mind, okay? That they had access to what the assertions are or the requirements on the component are, and you have specific needs that are being satisfied. And when you can do that full traceability across that system, that's when you know you're done and you have the evidence to show it. That's when you basically can say, okay, I know it's going to stay safe. So our challenge right now with these components is the fact that Stay by the mic. Um, open source doesn't. Open source doesn't have this concept of being surfacing out what the assertions are about the code, what should be, what the functions are, and in particular with the Linux kernel. Every time we put a patch request in, there's an information about why we're putting it in and when it should be working, as part of the uh, pull request. If you have effectively your your um, your top, your, your zero, zero patch to explain why you're doing this, that is effectively the assertions as to why. So the elements of this exist, but we have not made them available in a systemic fashion throughout the industry. So part of the challenge is going to be now is how can we start to make this information visible and where? <coughs> so what we've got is, you know, each patch does have a reason to be added. And, you know, it is, oh, this is so small, I can't barely see it here. <laughs> yes, old eyes, what can I say? Um, but, you know, there's a context that you expect a patch to work in. Okay. Does, 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 do you have a hand? You have, okay. Wait, no, no, I'm just saying I can, I can do, you just have to okay. do it. Okay. Now you can read it. Oh, thank you. Bless, blessings on you, Stephen. So we also know that when we actually put changes in, we have to test them and prove that it's working, it's doing what we wanted it to do functionally. But we also have the concept of when does it not work? And you have ways of making it better too? Oh, you, thank you. Okay, I'm being taken care of, I love it. <laughs> but. But proving when something is not working as you expected, it's going to go into a safe state. It's something we generally don't traditionally think about sometimes. Everyone's focused on getting the functionality working, show it what's working, but if something goes disastrously wrong, will it become in a reasonably safe state? Um, and so what, co what, what we're trying to expect and being able to capture that in a machine-readable form so that we can start to put tooling around it is, I think, a path towards automating this stuff. The same way we're starting to see us improve the transparency of what software we're running with SBOMs and things like that. We need to improve the transparency of what we expect the code to be doing so that we can link it to the tests in things like kernel CI and actually know if you make an update, it's going to be sane. So getting us, giving us a way of making assertions about what the code should do and in which context is a big missing piece for us to actually start to hook up and put automation in place. And I'm pretty much convinced, um, you know, we're not going to expect the maintainers to do it, flat out. Uh, if they want to, they can. I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to say that they can't. But realistically, there are people who have vested interests in making sure that we have some built some common understanding. The same way that the source code is effectively a standard way for us to share together and work, we need to basically start to have the documentation or of the, of the assertions of what the source code is doing shared and reviewed at, the system, at a wider level. So my hope is maybe that the maintainers will at least review these assertions that people are coming up with and saying, yes, my code is actually doing that, or no, you've got it completely wrong, which is useful. Go ahead. You want to throw the catch box? 
Where did it go? Ah, there, it's sitting at the end. Yeah. Trace the string it on. Okay. Thanks. So we maintainers are already overloaded. I know. And we That's already right. have a challenge. So what motivates us to review a documentation problem? <laughs> better, it's better if I, who don't maintain your code, have looked at your code and came up with a wildly incorrect idea about what it does. You can help me correct that. Then I'm going to create requirements or assertions from that, and you're going to go, no, you're still wrong. You don't know what you're talking about. And I'm going to keep narrowing down until I get it, until I really understand it. And then I'm going to say, is this it? And you're going to go, actually, that is it, but that's wrong. Not that we've reasoned through and really understand better. We've, we've actually required ourselves to write this down and start thinking it through. Now you're going to realize, oh man, you're making me think this through a lot more too. Interesting. I came up with some bad ideas. That's the idea. We don't expect you to do it, but we expect you to at least help us and tell me I'm being stupid and how do I become less stupid and then maybe something might reflect back on you and we go, oh, actually, no, I didn't even think of it at that level either. And the, the other thing I'll add into this, and will be hopefully beneficial to you down the road, is once we have these assertions in place, we should be able to link the tests that prove these assertions there such that you have a better regression suite and you'll have higher quality of coverage after you do security fixes. The goal here is we need to be able to, um, if you talk to Greg, he'll give you the stats on how often we're putting CVEs in right now, right? And if you're putting a CV and you want to make sure that you're minimizing your regression chances, thank you very much. And if we have a set of test cases we have affiliated with a piece of functionality and we know which files are touching these different requirements, we have a way of now starting to um, improve the quality of the regressions and making sure we have minimized regressions, especially in the place of security fixes, which is missing today. And so hopefully that will improve the quality of a maintainer's life. Maybe you can think of like a shadow staff for design. Okay, but let's, let's keep going so that we no, can. Gonna... Okay. Oh, Kate said what I was gonna say, okay. so. What? Oh, you're saying... you, you said what I was going to say. Okay, so. thanks. <laughs> and so, once we can clarify this missing piece of, of the assertions, you know, linking the code and linking the test to them is possible. We are prototyping it right now in Zephyr. So we should be able to do the same thing in the kernel. And so if we can do that, we suddenly become a way to automating a lot of mess out of the things. And quite frankly, improving the sustainability of the kernel and possibly getting rid of some things that are no longer needed, cleaned up. But there we go. Nope. There. So this afternoon's um, talks, and keep me on time here, because I think I'm on. Yeah, I'm the last minute. Okay. So in the schedule, you'll see we're we'll touching on a lot of these aspects that need to be pulled together to make this happen. And um, the key here, though, is you know we need to understand all the system elements. We have to select the components in the context for things, and then we have to identify gaps to make things safe. And if we can start to get this more engineering-wise, like more automated, I think we'll be in a better place for dealing with when people are using Linux in contexts that have safety requirements. Because they're doing it now, and I know people who have left certain organizations because they didn't like what they were seeing and they didn't want to be associated with working with Linux on that because of the quality issues and because they were worried about people. And I don't think any of us want that in this room. And so with that, I will queue up the next one. Thank you. Yeah.